I want to get now into two different aspects. One is a historical aspect of the classical theory of price, reminding you of the structure of the argument in Ricardo and uh, Smith, Ricardo and Marx. And then I want to use that as a foundation to talk about the meaning of the empirical evidence that I uh, laid out before, and particularly its relation to some very startling new arguments um, <clears throat> related to the empirical evidence, actually, that I've been developing for a long time. And we're going to end up with a discussion of the possibility that Marx's transformation, which has long been attacked as being incomplete, may turn out to be, in fact, complete uh, for reasons which are quite surprising and uh, very, very recent mathematical arguments. So <clears throat> let me just remind you of the classical origins uh, of the theory of relative price. Um, Adam Smith begins deliberately telling the story of relative prices by breaking uh, competition down into two parts. Competition among producers and then competition among capitals. <clears throat> so in the first instance, he develops what he calls the rude and early state, which is uh, an analytical argument that says, let us consider a situation in which we have commodity production and we have the mobility of producers from one sector to another in search of the highest income. Now notice that here, the producers are the owners of the means of production and the income they get comes from selling their product. So then he makes the following argument, which is in fact easily established analytically, which is that if you had a system in which you had private production for sale, but the owners, the producers got all the income, then the income would depend on the price. But if there was competition in the sense that there was mobility of uh, producers on one sector or another, then a sector that had a higher income per hour of labor versus a lower income of our labor, people would go from the lower to the higher more preferentially, and this would increase the supply relatively here, decrease it where the, price, where the uh, uh, income is lower. So this would lower the price by increasing the supply, so the income would come down, in the opposite case, income would come up, and you would end up with uh, a situation, turbulent perhaps, in which incomes would be equalized. Now, that notion, which is easily uh, shown analytically, implies that if incomes per hour are equal through the price, then the price has to be proportional to the direct and indirect labor time. Okay, That's easily shown, uh, and I'm going to come back to it in a minute anyway. So what you end up with is Adam Smith's starting point, which is prices proportional to labor time, which he calls the rude and early state. But as Marx points out, it's really an analytical step because it allows us then to ask the question, what are the factors that cause prices to deviate from this proportionality? In Marx's terms, what causes prices to deviate from labor values? Right away, Smith says, consider the situation which I just set up, in which the producers get all of their, um, all the, the, the price, and therefore their income is basically the price minus their costs, their value added. And if they are the only factor then in the story, then value added per worker will be equalized, and that's equal to the income per worker and therefore price is proportional to labor time. Now Smith says, okay, but now suppose I divide that value added up in that a portion goes to capital and a portion goes to landlord. So now he's introduced private property in the means of production and class in just one step. Everybody understand that? And in that step, he also says it's obvious that this division of the value added does not in itself imply any reason for prices to deviate from labor values, from direct and indirect labor time. As long as the division keeps the total value added the same, in other words, as every class gets a fraction of the value added, which is the same across sectors, then you will get uh, prices proportional to labor time. So imagine, imagine that we start off with a situation in which uh, one set of producers here, another set there, and this set is getting $12 an hour of labor time, in other words, value added per hour of $12, and this one is getting 10, right? So then we say that more people are going to enter here and bring the value added per worker down to 11. And because people are leaving the lower one, the value added per worker goes up to 11. Right? So roughly, you get $11 per hour of value added. But they're only private producers. So that's also the income per hour uh, in each sector because the mobility of the producers is equalized the income per hour. Okay? Now, Smith says, okay, but this 11 here, suppose I uh, introduce analytically now class relations. So now the producers become workers. They weren't before, they were private producers, but now analytically they're workers. So they get five. The other six goes to land and uh, uh, capital. So four to capital, two to rent. It adds up to 11. Same over here. The proportions are the same. So now we've established that the division of value added 
into profits, rents, and wages does not in itself require any deviation of prices from labor times. Right? Because he's already established that you can have that division. So what has he done? He's shown he's introduced competition. He's shown he can uh, introduce equalization of wages. And as long as there are equal proportional divisions in the, in the different components, then there's no necessity for prices to change at all. Now, consider one more step. Suppose that, the, ignore for the land because it's the same issue. So let's suppose we divided that 11 into five for workers, six for capital. And five for workers here and six for capital there, right? Because the equalization makes value added the same. Now, clearly, if the capital labor ratios were the same, then the six for capital would give you the same profit rate here as it would there. So obviously then, even equalization of profit rates is not in itself a reason for prices to deviate from labor values. What is specific is the deviation of capital labor ratios, the difference of capital labor ratios. And that alone is the reason. Not competition, not equalization of profit rates, not class, not equalization of wage rates, but specifically the capital labor differences, or what Marx would call organic compositions of capital differences. Is that point clear? Because I can go over that uh, many times until it does become clear. Yeah. One question then. <clears throat> would that imply that if you have different capital labor ratios among industries, that means that each industry uh, distributes uh, value added among the classes in a different way? Indeed. And you know, how can it do that? It only because uh, only by prices being different from labor values, right? So it was already known to Smith and Ricardo and Marx that you can explain the existence of class and the uh, functions of competition and the existence of profit, therefore. Because Smith says it's obvious from this analytical perspective that the reason there is a profit and a rent is because the wage of workers is below the value added. And Marx says, aha, that's surplus value. So <clears throat> that understanding is already in Smith. And I'm going to show you that Marx specifically cites, and Ricardo cites Smith also for that understanding. So what does that establish? It establishes that without any deviation of prices from labor values, we can explain profits and rents the existence of them. We can explain the material basis for class. <clears throat> we can ex explain that it comes from the fact that the wage has to be below value added. That's the condition, right? That's the clear uh, general condition. And then this does not necessarily uh, contradict equalization of profit rates because if the capital labor ratios are equal, then that profit of six in each sector would be the same profit rate in the two sectors because the capital labor ratios are equal. Okay? <clears throat> Is that point clear? This is easy to show analytically, but I'm going to do it anyway in a minute because we already did it with Adam Smith's uh, uh, decomposition of price into direct and indirect uh, costs and profits, and we already showed this, so I'm going to come back to that in a minute. Smith then goes on to argue that, in fact, you can break the price of any commodity into its costs and value added, and the value added can be broken into wages and profits, and then the cost can be broken into wages and profits, and value added, uh, and input costs, and so on, and you go back and forth until finally you've got uh, broken down the price of any commodity into two components, direct and indirect unit labor costs, and direct and indirect uh, price, uh, I'm sorry, profit per unit output. And I did that before, and what we ended up showing, I can always break the price into two terms, any price whatsoever, market price, monopoly price, is just an analytical decomposition into Wages of the i-th sector times the direct and indirect labor time of the i-th sector, and wages of the j-th sector times that. So this first term is relative vertically integrated, what I call integrated unit labor costs. And the second is simply the ratio of profits to this, this term, which is the profit-wage ratio, but vertically integrated. Now this decomposition, if wages are equal, which is what Smith's concern is with prices of production, uh, with natural prices, wages are equalized, then this depends only on two terms. The ratio of direct and indirect labor time, this is Marx's labor value ratio, and the ratio of profits to wages, the division of value added. Okay? Now notice that if the division of value added is the same, then the ratio of profits to wages is the same, and therefore prices are directly proportional to labor time. That's another way of arriving at that same story, right? And then anything that makes the profit wage ratios equal will give you prices proportional to labor time. Conversely, anything that makes them unequal will give you prices different. So then Smith says, well, by showing this, I've established that it's not the presence of capitalist relations, not wage labor versus profit per se, that requires a deviation of relative prices from relative integrated labor time. I've even shown that if, uh, or actually Ricardo says, well, even if capital labor ratios are equal, then this is also proportional to give you equal profit rates, sorry. It will give you equal profit rates, so that's consistent with equalization of profit rates also. And we can see from the way the logic of the argument works that the relative prices of production of any two commodities will be dependent only on two things. The relative labor, integrated labor time, relative labor values in the sense of Marx, times 
this term, which is a kind of disturbance term, deviation term, and that'll depend on, I can take the profit and divide it and treat it as a profit rate times the amount of vertically integrated capital. And the vertically integrated labor is the wage rate times the vertically integrated labor time, vertically integrated wage bill. So the profit wage ratio is just R over W times this ratio of vertically integrated capital per unit labor. And since the profit rates are equalized, they're the same in the top and the bottom. Wages are equalized, same in the top and bottom. And that establishes that the only cause of the deviation only competitive, of, of competitive prices, prices of production, from labor time is vertically integrated capital labor ratio differences. Okay, we did this last time, but that's a very important point. It's not the direct differences, the vertically integrated. And what vertical integration means is that the ratio that's relevant is not the observed capital labor ratio, but the ratio that is, in fact, a weighted average of all the capital labor ratios of industries that enter into a given industry. So if I say, this is the first industry, it's corn. Corn's capital labor ratio is six. But the vertically integrated capital labor ratio is six, plus a weighted average of that and that and that and that, all the ones that enter. And so it'll be a different number. It might be five. If this one here was uh, three, if I take the weighted average of all the ones that enter here, it might be four, because it'll bring you towards the mean, but you're taking an average of all the others, right? So you're going to end up with, instead of six and three, you're going to end up with five and four. And you can see right away that that dispersion is smaller. Hence, these, this term will be less important. Uh, in the way that uh, Smith derives the direct and indirect profit, it's simply the profit of the sector we're considering, plus the profits of the raw materials of that sector, which come from all the sectors that it uses as inputs, plus the profits of the raw materials of the raw materials, which come from all the sectors used by that bundle and so on. And that's equivalent to saying that when I look at the profit wage ratio, I'm looking not at the direct profit ratio, but the weighted average of all the profit wage ratios of industries that enter directly or indirectly into this production. Now, if it was a basic system, then all of them enter directly or indirectly. So that means that everybody's profit wage ratio is a weighted average of the same set of raw numbers, which is your direct profit wage ratios. But the weights will be different because you have different materials requirements. And that's known as a convex combination. It's a, a, a sum of positive numbers that add up to one. You can show that formally in this kind of a thing. And so that everybody will get a number assigned to them, which will be a weighted average of everybody's original numbers. So you have here, uh, if I can count that far, five, six, seven, ten people, right? So there'll be ten profit wage ratios. So I take the first one here and I replace it by a weighted average of all ten, right? Then I take the second one and I replace it by a weighted average of the same ten but a different set of weights. So that's the second one. The third one will be again a weighted average of all ten with a different set of weights depending on your input requirement. And you can, quick, you can see why the dispersion of these ratios is going to be much smaller. And therefore this term will be less relevant. It depends on the input proportion. You can calculate this from the way I broke out the uh, Smithian decomposition. You can see that at each point, the weights will depend on the ratio of inputs to outputs in each layer, so to speak. And you can calculate through that. And this is analytically I minus A inverse. I mean, that's basically what you're doing. You're taking the direct profit wage ratio, multiplying it by I minus inverse, A inverse matrix, and then you get the vertically integrated one. And I showed you last time that the dispersion of the vertically integrated one is only one third the coefficient of variation of the direct ones. So already we know that there is an analytical reason why this dispersion is going to be small. And I, I would argue that that was pretty clear to people like Smith and Ricardo. They didn't formulate it algebraically, but it was clear from observation that you could see that uh, uh, an industry that produces steel, that uses steel, is going to pick up, so to speak, the profit wage ratio of steel. But steel has iron and has uh, coal as its raw materials. So it's going to pick up those too, and you could sort of see why Ricardo would understand, let's say, that this would not be a big factor. And it's that kind of reasoning that leads Ricardo to say, look, the secondary, this distributional factor is relatively small. And we went through the empirical evidence last time in the US economy, uh, which I have for different years. I only illustrated a little bit of it. And you can see that this term uh, is on the order of 10 or 15% at best, at most. Uh, if you take another argument and say, what happens if I raise the wage uh, here? I raise this wage. Well, we know the profit rate's going to go down, and I'm going to talk about that today. So this term, R over W, is going to move but in the same way in both top and bottom. So the only effect, uh, the elasticity of prices with respect to distribution will depend on the dispersion of these capital labor ratios, again. Now, with this understanding, we come to Ricardo, because Ricardo already knows this. This is in Smith. And so Ricardo says, OK, uh, I want to pick up the question of how big is this factor? And he chose, chooses to do it in a variety of ways. One question he asks is, that one thing he makes clear is that these relative prices deviate from relative labor times only uh, according to the uh, capital labor ratios. And, and though he doesn't use the term vertically integrated, if you look at his numerical example, 
you can see that it depends not only on the capital labor ratio of the industry, but also on the capital labor ratio of the industry that produces the inputs. Because he gives you a specific example. He says, consider a machine is made by hand. And then consider that the machine is used to make cloth or cotton. And he shows in this example, therefore, that there's a certain deviation. And you can work backwards to that and see that it depends not only on the cloth uh, capital labor ratio, but also on the machine capital labor ratio, because the machine is an input. Okay? So Ricardo's example is very nice because it's simple, it's clean, and elegant, and it expresses his understanding that this uh, deviations are not very big. If you look at the numerical example, you see that the relative deviations of prices from labor time are quite small. But then Ricardo asks a different question. He says, well, okay, I've given you an example where this deviation is not very big, but I want to ask a question, what happens if I raise the wage? And his point is, if you raise the wage, you lower the profit rate so that both R over W here and here move in the same direction. And how much they cause a disturbance depends on these relative capital labor ratios again. And he ends up saying, well, I don't think except uh, even in the most exceptional circumstances, that relative prices will vary much more than about 7%, even though there's a big change in distribution. Now, I remind you that this is the question that Jacob Schwartz picks up when he looks at the changes in relative prices from the peak of a business cycle to the trough. And we looked at that last time, and you saw that the average variation was 7%. Again, it's not because Ricardo was a mystic. He, Ricardo was undoubtedly observing variations in relative prices over cycles, since that was something you could see. So he got a sense of the order of magnitude, and his example was designed to illustrate that order of magnitude. Schwartz actually goes and tests it, because now we have data on that, at least uh, by the post-war period. And he found that when you take relative prices at the peak of a business cycle, and then whatever the next 11, 12, 15 months later, the trough of a business cycle, the variation in relative prices was only on the order of 7%. And I showed you uh, Claudio Putti's example, which is done as a dissertation from this course, actually. Um, and, uh, he found roughly on that same order, eight, seven to eight or nine percent, on a much, much bigger sample of uh, and much time period and many more industries also. The same thing. So this is a very strong general empirical result that we expect this term to be relatively small on average, which is what we're talking about here. Ricardo also shows that prices differ from relative labor times according to the capital labor ratio. That's clear from his numerical example. So he's the source of the idea in Marx that these differences are due to differences in organic composition of capital. And Mark cites that, as I'm going to show you in a minute. He also shows that a rise in the real wage will lead to a real wage will lead to a fall in the general rate of profit. And he does this in a very clever way. He shows it uh, numerically. But the argument is very clever. He says, well, suppose that you had an uh, economy in which the raw material was corn, the wage good was corn, and the output was corn. Well, clearly value added will be corn. If wage goes up, and the value added is determined by the technology and the length of the working day and all that, if wage goes up, profit will go down. <clears throat> that will not affect the amount of corn that you need as capital, right? Because that depends on your materials and your fixed capital. So the profit rate will go down. So intuitively, at the aggregate level, you can see that a wage rise, real wage rise, corresponds to fall in the profit rate. Again, the logic of that is very clear, and we're going to see Srafa's incredibly beautiful and elegant uh, extension of that, but he shows, Srafa shows essentially in a formal way that this is the case, and it's obvious in Marx also that he understood that and built that into his argument from the beginning, which he does by saying, let's assume prices are proportional to labor time. Then it's obvious that the wage good, uh, wages go up, the rate of surplus value goes down, the profit rate goes down. Okay? So these are familiar, so to speak, and the last point that Ricardo was concerned with, which is important, is he says, well, okay, if this term is small, uh, then relative prices are close to relative integrated labor time. But notice also that then the changes in relative prices will be dominated by the uh, structural element, which is direct and indirect labor time. And the distributional element will be a second order, will be disturbance term. And I showed you data on that last time. And you can see again that that uh, is absolutely empirically true. Uh, again, the order of variation is on the 10 or 15% magnitude. So that means that this is really the dominant term here, both in cross-sectional and time series. And I showed you that if you look over a four-year period, four to five-year period, the relative changes, changes in relative prices are uh, extremely close to the changes in relative labor times. The difference is on the order of four or five percent or three or four percent. So that really 96 or 97 percent of relative price changes over time can be explained by changes in the structure of production. Now, it should be 
beginning to be clear to you that this is a profoundly different way of looking at relative prices. Because this is saying that the structure of production is the dominant element, and this was the natural way in the classical tradition. Any questions here? I want to move to Marx. Okay. Ricardo, as you know, begins in the uh, first chapter of the principles uh, uh, and uh, moves to, uh, from prices proportional to labor time to prices that deviate from labor time within 50 pages. Marx being Marx, he starts the same way, but it takes him uh, something like 1,300 pages to move from the first to the second step. And the reason is that he's interested in showing where profit comes from rather than how it's distributed. And so uh, he's interested in the distribution also, but he he's not, does, not, does not want to introduce the price labor time deviations un, until he's extracted fully, so to speak, all the phenomena that follow from the creation of a surplus product and its uh, 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 assignment, so to speak, to different capitalists and rent later on also in volume three of capital. So the argument is incredibly detailed, focuses on the historical rise of surplus value, on its implications, on exploitation, the length of the working day, the reserve army of labor, uh, schemes of reproduction, two sectoral growth and balance conditions, turnover time, all of those factors which as he rightly points out have nothing to do per se with the deviation of prices from labor time and can be seen more clearly if we leave that part for later because all of that will simply add on to what you've already shown. This is the proper way to proceed because it then establishes that when you're making that change you're introducing something very specific which is the price labor time deviations and not all the other elements which are implicit already there without that. And you can see that coming from Smith, who's already shown this kind of uh, logic, you can, you, you can see why he picks it up. So Marx has forms of value, origin, significance of money, social implications of generalized exchange, social and class origins of profit, uh, exploitation, the determination of wages, the length of the working day, the struggle over the length of the working day. All of these are inherent in the existence of profit, of the surplus product, have nothing to do per se with price value deviations. And here's Marx's comment, by the way, uh, in theories of surplus value on Smith's treatment of profit and prices. And Marx here credits Smith with discovering surplus value. Now I'm quoting. This is from um, Theories of Surplus Value, uh, Chapter 3, Part 1, Chapter 3. Marx says, quote, Adam Smith quite correctly takes as his starting point the commodity and the exchange of commodities. And thus producers initially confront each other only as possessors of commodities, sellers of commodities, buyers of commodities under conditions which lead to the equality between relative competitive prices and relative labor values. So that's Smith's root in early state. And Marx's comment there is that that's a correct starting point because it separates out commodity production from capitalist commodity production. And you can introduce capitalist commodity production without changing the law of price until you introduce unequal uh, organic compositions of capital in a sense. Then here are further quotes from Marx and the same thing. The cap capitalist production begins from the moment when the conditions of labor belong to one class and another class has his disposal only labor power. Again, commenting on Smith. And this is Smith's move from having all of the uh, income of production going to the producer to suddenly only part going because the producer has been transformed into a wage labor and the remainder goes to the capitalist. This separation of labor from the conditions of labor is the precondition of capitalist production, Marx says. Uh, but then he goes on to say, but the law of exchange in proportion to labor time contained in them <coughs> is contained in the commodities, is in no way upset by the proportion with the producers divide the product, or rather their value. If part A goes to the landowner, another to the capitalist, and a third to the laborer, no matter what the share of each may be, this does not alter the fact that A itself exchanges with B according to its value. This is commenting on Smith's root and early state. In this case, quote, value that is the quantity of labor which workmen add to the material falls into two parts. One pays his wages, the other forms the profit of the capitalist. Adam Smith has therefore himself refuted the idea that the circumstance under which the whole product of the labor no longer belongs to the labor, that he's obliged to share its value uh, with the owner of capital, in itself invalidates the law that the proportion in which commodities exchange for each other is determined by the quantity of labor time materialized in them. Is that point clear? He's saying, look, Adam Smith has already shown, therefore shows that sharing out the value added between workers and capitalists, or the dispossession of workers' share and uh, control by capital, does not need to alter the relation of price to direct and indirect labor time. This, he says, establishes that industrial profit is perfectly com compatible with the sale of commodities at their labor value. Industrial profit does not, quote, originate from the sale of commodities above its value. It is not profit on alienation. 
Now, if you're me, a little bing goes off, profit and alienation, what is he talking about? I spent a lot of time before making the point that Marx understood perfectly well that there are two sources of profit. And here he's telling us, the reason you want to do it this way is that it excludes <coughs> profit and alienation. And so you can concentrate on profit on surplus value. And he says, quote, again, indeed, on the contrary, Smith traces the profit of the capitalist precisely to the fact that he has not paid for part of the labor value, labor added to the commodity. And it is from this that his profit on the sale of commodity arises. Therefore, he has recognized the true origin of surplus value. And then he goes on to comments on Smith's division of that surplus value into rent of land, taxes, and interests. Adam Smith conceives surplus value, that is, surplus labor, the excess of labor performed and realized in the commodity, over and above the paid labor, the labor which has received its equivalent in wages, as a general category. And he says this is one of the great contributions of Smith. He, he says that the rents, interests, profits are part of that same general pool of the excess of value over the value paid to labor. And this general category is therefore what he wants to examine first before he talks about the rules of its division. Okay? Now, Marx views Smith's commodity production, he makes it very clear in this discussion in Theory of Surplus Value, that it's an analytical device. And in fact, um, it's only Engels who attempts to extend it back in time. And this is a big confusion in the Marxist literature. Some people see this as an earlier stage in history. But Marx's point is that, look, there was never a stage in history where people had freely able to move from one sector of production to another, one industry to another, and kept all their income and owned their means of production. This was an analytical argument, not a historical one. Nonetheless, Engels, and even to some extent Ernest Mandel, tried to find historical uh, echoes, so to speak. And it's possible that there are circumstances where that's the case. But uh, it's not, in my opinion, it's not the argument that uh, is set out in, uh, certainly not in Marx. In fact, Marx uh, speaks of the rude and early state as a projection onto, I quote, a paradise lost of the bourgeoisie, where people do not confront each other as capitalists, wage laborers, landowners, tenant farmers, usurers, and so on, but simply as persons who produce commodities and exchange them. And that idea of, uh, um, the, he says this in the contribution to a critique, of political economy, which he wrote before he wrote Theories of Surface Value. And this is a comment on the idea that this is a fiction, the root and early state. It's not intended to be a reference. Yet, in volume one of Capital, Marx follows the same path. And that's not because he thinks this is a historical starting point, but because he considered this to be the general analytical starting point. He starts off by saying, let us consider a situation in which private uh, in commodity producers, what he calls simple commodity production, produce a product and exchange it with each other. And if there's mobility among the producers in, in, reference, in response to differences in their income, then they will end up with prices proportional to labor values. That's exactly Smith's argument. Uh, it always surprises me that people don't see these things, like profit and alienation, the simple commodity production, as it, so they're pretty clearly stated. The trouble is, of course, that they're stated in different parts of works that Marx didn't live to publish. And so you need to find them, so to speak. Um, Marx says, in that section, volume... Uh, one of capital. Uh, he says, the conversion of money into capital has to be explained on the basis of laws that regulate the ex exchange of commodities in such a way that the starting point is exchange of equivalents. Again, that's a clear reference to profit and alienation, which he wants to exclude. He says himself there, it's no, we know full well that average prices do not directly coincide with the values of commodities. What is he signaling there? He's, he's telling what Ricardo has already shown, that prices deviate from labor values when you allow for differences in uh, uh, capital labor ratios. But he um, leaves that aside for volume three of capital. Because he wants to first show where profit comes from. Profit of industrial capital comes from, not merchant capital, which is based on transfers. And he wants to show how it works, what uh, phenomenon gives rise to. And the trouble, of course, is he doesn't live to do the rest. He says he's going to do this, uh, mostly in unpublished parts anyway. And then he doesn't finish. And then Engels puts that stuff together in the way that he can, the best that he can. And it shows up in volume three. As I said, 1,340 pages later, Marx comes to the question that takes Ricardo 30 pages to get to, which is the deviation of prices from labor time. Because this is a long journey and because it goes through uh, material which Marx did not live to publish himself and was put together by Engels, even careful scholars have become confused and think that he was avoiding that issue. But if you look at the contribution to critique, he says, I'm going to solve all of these problems, including this one. Prices deviate from labor values. I'm going to show you how it's done. So it's not like he didn't know. 
uh, going on to com comment on Ricardo. Ricardo's investigations are concerned exclusively with the magnitude of value. He's at least aware that the full development of the law of value presupposes a society in which large-scale industrial production and free competition obtain, in other words, modern bourgeois society. David Ricardo, quoting again, David Ricardo, unlike Adam Smith, neatly sets forth the determination of values of commodities by labor time and demonstrates that this law governs even those bourgeois relations of production which apparently contradict it most decisively, meaning here the deviations, are still governed by this law of value. Ricardo does this I quote, uh, with, quote, theoretical acumen, which gives classical political economy its final shape. And what's the center point made by Ricardo, according to Marx? According to Marx, the center point made by Ricardo was, quote, the law of value dominates price movements with reductions or increases in labor time, making prices of production fall or rise. Okay, so th this is, I, I can't think of any clearer statement of the point, and if you know the literature, you know what he's talking about. So this is like reading any literature. If you don't know the, what the references mean, you won't get it. But once you know it, you can see this pretty clear. Any questions about this? I'm a little bit confused by this. Um, He's talking about a production under class relations where he's separating profits from alienation from profits on surplus. Profit on surplus from profit on transfer. Okay. okay. Those are two. And okay. he calls profit on transfer profit on alienation. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, 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 yeah. Why does he call for that alienation? Like, why does, what is, <laughs> now you say transfer, it makes sense to me. No, but in fact, when you, when you read the uh, theory of surplus value, you see Marx says, uh, yeah, of course Stuart is right. The profit on transfer, which I will call profit on alienation. So you, you might ask him that question. I don't know. <laughs> But he specifically used the term profit and alienation. In some sense, you can see that it's the alienation. In, uh, he's speaking of merchant capital historically, and that is where uh, developed capitalist relations impinge on less developed ones and, or uh, weaker ones, stronger ones impinge on weaker ones. We can get a, a commodity at a price lower than you finally sell it. So you buy cheap and sell dear. And then you alienate that commodity. In effect, you take it from people who could have gotten a higher price, and you transport it, deducting that. You still make a profit. So that difference is the profit on Transfer. But doesn't the exact same thing happen in the extraction of surplus? No, because there marks a central point. Of, no, because there marks a central point there is that capitalism establishes a relationship in which the price of labor power is that what it gets. He's already saying, I'm not going to deal with cheating by capitalism and all of that. I'm going to take it for granted that uh, workers get a market wage which is established. And the point is the value of labor power is just as much that correct value as the commodity price is assumed to be sold at also with its correct value, right? But profit and alienation is different because you know that you're selling, you're buying it cheap. And you know you're selling it dear. So that's a different process. And typically, by the way, this is an interesting point. And I'm going to I leave. feel when I'm selling my labor power that I'm being, selling it, like I want more and then I'm unemployed. Okay, but that's because you've read Marx. <laughs> <laughs> you've been corrupted. <laughs> Most people actually think no, that they no, get no, a fair no, wage. That's, uh, so, that's true. So, but so um, uh, markup prices is profit for alienation? You can say that? No, because. Uh, the idea of market prices is an explanation of where the profit comes from. And I tried to argue in a couple lectures back that that's a fiction. You cannot have profit originating from market prices. All that market prices can do is share it out in different ways. For instance, if you have start with the argument in Marx, let's say that we begin with all of the value of labor power going to workers. So there's no surplus value. I tried to show you a means of analytical examples that there's no possible way to create aggregate profit. All you can do is create profit in one sector and a negative profit in the other because the aggregate will have to be zero. That can be formally shown. If there's no surplus product, there's no aggregate product, profit. So market prices cannot in any way create aggregate profit. All they can do, all the story of, uh, and I spent quite a time in the book on this issue, all that the story of market pricing does is make the argument that there is a mechanism through which way workers get a wage below the value added. And that difference is the markup. So workers only get what capitalists choose to give them. And capitalists only choose to take what they consider their monopoly power. A very vague concept, in my opinion. Uh, terminally vague. vague. Now notice that neoclassical theory does the same thing, by the way. It says workers get a portion of value added. How does it say that? It says, well, look, we divide value added into two parts. The marginal product of labor times the amount of labor, which is the wage bill, plus the marginal product of capital times the amount of capital, which is profit. But that story has, requires that the marginal product of labor be less than, or the wage bill be less than value added. In other words, the marginal product be less than value added per worker. If that's not the case, there's no marginal product of capital left over. So by making the assumptions that these are positive numbers, less than one, and all of that, you end up with the same story, which is that workers get a wage less than the value added, except in neoclassical theory, it's what they deserve because that, that's their contribution. All the theories end up saying profit comes from where Adam Smith said. It's a division of value added into one part for labor, another part for capital. But then the question becomes, how is that division accomplished? 
in Marx, it's through the fact that workers are divorced from the means of production, they have to accept the value added less. It's a really Smith story too. When the capital comes up, they no longer own the means of production, so they have to give a cut, so to speak. And they have to take a cut, so to speak, in that. In neoclassical theory, the big object is to show that it's justified. And post-Keynesian theory <coughs> avoids this issue quite a bit because it leads to an embarrassing conclusion, which is that workers have no say in their uh, living standard. I, I, once, I remember once asking at a post-Keynesian conference, asking a famous post-Keynesian economist, you know, how can you, don't you think you should be explaining how workers' wages uh, are determined? And the answer was, that's a good question. We should look into that in the future. Now, I, I find that an astonishing answer, truly astonishing. Okay? Uh, one question. Can you, can you then explain um, gender or race-based wage discrimination in terms of sort of buying cheap and selling beer? Or? Indeed. You can, uh, but the question then, yes, indeed. And, and uh, I, let me just, remind me if I get lost here in another digression, but you have to keep in mind that Marx's original project was to write six volumes, six, I'm sorry, six books, of which the first book was called On Capital. On Capital was going to be four volumes, which include theories of surplus value. So the, all the material that we have that Marx published was only the first quarter of the first book. First quarter of the first book. The rest was put together by Engels, and theory of surplus value was cobbled together from his notes. But if you look at his plan, his plan was to consider the actual determination and movements of wages. Because at this level of abstraction, he's saying, I'm going to ignore all of that because I want to bring out all the phenomena that come from the fact that even if wages are equalized. But I don't want to argue that they are equalized in practice. I want to bring in those elements scientifically one thing at a time. Right? So then he, his goal was to do that, and he did a tremendous amount of research on wages and wage differences and all of that, but that doesn't show up in anywhere in capital because that material is it's probably there. I mean, sure, it's in his notes, but um, it's not in the published material that we have. Same thing for business cycles. Marx uh, abstracts from business cycles except in, in references to historical phenomena, but he worked a lot on that, and then he taught himself calculus, as I mentioned before, in order to think about how to formalize his movements of ups and downs because uh, that's a kind of... Uh, thing that calculus could naturally pick up. And who knows what he did with that. I do know that he wrote a book on calculus because he got annoyed with the way the foundations of calculus, the idea of the infinitesimal, seemed to him wrong and he set up a different foundation, not knowing at that time that mathematics was already moving away from the his foundation that he was attacking and a new foundation for mathematics and calculus was being developed in Europe, in France actually. So, so these are what people like this do in their spare time. Uh, and he didn't have much spare time. He also worked on rent. The theory of rent is treated in volume three of capital, and he treats it according to the laws of uh, competition, the pure laws. He says, I want to derive from these assumptions that everybody gets what is appropriate in the market, the laws of rent. But it doesn't mean that rent actually is identical to that. You have to show the concrete factors. And he thought the best, way, best place to study rent was Russia. I don't, I don't really know enough about Russia to know why he thought that. But anyway, he felt that this was the historical development of rent would be best illustrated through the history of Russia. So he taught himself Russian in his spare time so he could study those documents better. Of course, he read German, he read French, he read Italian and English and so on, but he picked up Russian too so that he could study documents, historical documents. You can see also why he never finished anything, which is another story. But. Okay, so the question you raise is very interesting to me because then the question is how do you make more concrete the laws of wages? And the first step, in my opinion, is to talk about what determines the wage at a concrete level. Even if you abstract from all the other factors, uh, and that's the book that came out of this course by Howard Botwinick called Persistent Inequality. Uh, Howard uh, was a graduate of Wisconsin, uh, undergrad, uh, undergraduate. Then he went and worked for, I think, a decade or more as a uh, steel worker and organizer and then came to graduate school and he wrote his book on how competition produces a dispersion of wages. And his point is that when you distinguish between regulating and non-regulating capitals, you already have capitals who are in a different position vis-a-vis -vis labor because regulating capitals are in a stronger position than non-regulating, and he shows us you can explain uh, the kinds of patterns you do observe in average wages from precisely this sort of uh, understanding, which he got from the shop floor, so to speak. So there's room, uh, and the other person who worked on this was Patrick Mason, who also came from this course, who worked on, on the issues of uh, wage by race. So I, I think this is a, a topic which needs to be developed much further, but you can't do it without having this. This is the law of gravity at its abstract level then you need to introduce all those factors. Because the other side of that, I would argue, is that these differences are not arbitrary. They're bounded. And so that's an important thing to understand. In any kind of analysis, you need to know the bounds also. Um, I tried uh, at one point to, to get people interested in doing this issue because we have data now using input-output tables. Uh, here's another related issue. I told this was going to be a rant. Um, 
in the level of abstraction that Smith, Ricardo, and Marx operate at that level of abstraction, they abstract from skills. Right? So we need to have a proper extension of this argument to skills, which I did in my dissertation. I didn't like it, so some 30, 40 years later, I did it again. It's sitting around in my computer someplace. I've never found a place to publish it. But you can develop the argument uh, in this classical tradition of a theory of skill-based wages, based on the cost of skilling. Now, it's not the same as human capital. It's a different thing. It's a production cost of skilling rather than sort of some capital embodied in your head that you're walking around with. And that implies a theory of wage differentials. In order to do this, what you need to do is take input output tables and apply skill indexes to that. Now, we have wage indexes, so you're basically looking to see what's the relation between wage indexes and skill indexes. And that, people have been doing that, but they've been doing it from a neoclassical framework. Becker dominates everything, and so even people working in the classical tradition are working in that at a concrete level. And there's no reason to do that. In my opinion, you can come up with a different understanding. And perhaps it's not better. But as a former student of Gary Becker, I don't think it could be any worse because that data doesn't work. I mean, that analysis does not work very well at an empirical level at all. <laughs>